opposition. We are not alone. Our wonderful panelists are doing great things in their community, something that many of, of you are doing, trying, thinking about, and just need some insight and support as to how to move forward. We hope that these networking workshops are helpful to you and that you can give us some suggestions of other workshops you would like to see in the future. This is gonna keep us connected across this country. This is gonna make us do more than just network once a year when we attend a meeting, but this is something that we can do regularly because thank God for Zoom, okay? <laughs> so anyway, I would like to also thank Gustavo from Urban Maine for all his work in making these workshops happen. He also will facilitate the Q&A sessions. I would also like to give a special thanks to the Woodlawn Summit Committee in Chicago, Illinois, and their yearly networking summits that keeps the city of Chicago networking with the local community, which is something that you all might think about doing in your communities if you're not doing it already, but that's another workshop topic. I'm chairperson of the Economic Development Committee, and, it's, and this workshop is also follow-up to their 2020 virtual summit event. Right now, I'm going to turn you over to my co-moderator, Dion Boyd. I have known Dion for many years. She has much experience in a variety of areas such as government, philanthropic, and community economic development. Dion motivates, she educates, and collaborates all over this country, and we are so fortunate to have her energy and commitment as we move through these pre- and post-COVID times. So please put your speakers on mute, write your questions down for the Q&A in the chat box, and at the end of the session, Gustavo will take over and we'll call on you to ask your questions because we want to have a vibrant discussion, okay? Dion, I'm turning it over to you. What a fantastic introduction. Thank you, Sandra. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. Sandra, although you have known me for a number of years, you will not pronounce my last name correctly. It is Bo, like a bow tie. Oh. <laughs> Just like a bow tie. And if oh. any of you know me, I am very concerned about how I pronounce names and how names are pronounced because those are the names that our parents gave us. Um, you, you guys cannot see me today and I apologize. I did try to join via um, my cellular phone so I could see you, um, but unfortunately it just was a little bit too distracting. Um, but again, I am Dion Bo, Vice President of Urban Programs. I'm really glad to see so many individuals from Chicago, but as well as other folks from across the country. Um, I'm going to give you, just so you, you won't be able to see me physically, because I'm actually in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District um, right now, working with the historic Greenwood Main Street as they are trying to revitalize. Um, so it has just been an, a very emotional morning for me. Um, and as and it, I think it's quite opportune that this lunch and learn session is about equitable entrepreneurship. Yeah, so, can we take a minute? Uh, I forgot to ask people to introduce themselves so we even know who's on the call. Sure. You want to go around the room and have folks introduce themselves? Yes. Why don't we start with Andrea? Just give us a Well, a well, well what, I, what I'm saying is I think you're not going to have enough time. Okay. to be able to do that. Right. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry. We only have scheduled an hour and a half and I need to like be really brief and get off of the call at 1.30 to start my next set of interviews. So I, I apologize. You guys may not be able to um, go around and do formal introductions because you have about 26 participants on the, on the, um, on the Zoom call today, but I would encourage you guys to introduce yourselves on Zoom. Introduce yourself, talk on, on the chat. What organization are you representing? Your name and what city are you from? Just so we can see where folks are coming from from across the country. Sorry, Sandra, I would have loved to be able to give you that time, but we are short on time today. Okay. Um, well, at least I am. Um, so before we jump into the presentation, one, I just wanna give you a brief overview about Main Street America. We're known for our four points, what you see here to start, economic vitality, design, organization, and promotion. And for the past few years, we've really been focused on community transformation and ensuring that the community is at the table, transforming its own community. Again, many individuals may start with market data. They may feel like they bring consultants in to, to do a lot of this work, but if the community does not buy in, 
a lot of your businesses may not be able to thrive. So I think it is very important for us to always think about that. Market data does not lead. It actually supports what the community would like to see. Next slide, please. So since we're talking about entrepreneurship, Mainster has really been focused on entrepreneurship ecosystems for the past eight to, you know, I would say eight years. And we really want to ensure that our Main Street leaders are being able to see themselves by, you know, utilizing this system, but really ensuring that local leaders and residents are equipped with this practical frame framework to improve the quality of life in their own communities. When we're thinking about the role of entrepreneurship ecosystems, it's really thinking about how are local Main Street managers, commercial district managers, executive directors, bid improvement districts, whatever you call yourselves, are connecting, making the appropriate connections to programs, access to capital, small business planning workshops, really entrepreneurs that are independent, small scale businesses, and those are, that are business of color really benefit from locations in neighborhood commercial districts and understanding how to connect those, those entrepreneurs to those resources are helpful to make sure that they're thriving. As well as these local managers, you know, in your role, understanding the talent attraction needs of these businesses that are being located into your district. What type of people do they need? Who are they trying to recruit to work at their businesses to make sure they're thriving? Are they recruiting people from the community? As well as the value of place. Your places are so important. And again, I think it is opportune or it is appropriate, whatever the right word is, that I'm here in the Greenwood District. This is a place that has historic significance to African-Americans around the country, right? This place means something. And so to bring this place back, just like 51st Street means something, just like you know, many of the districts that Richmond, California, or District Bridges, MLK, it means something to the residents. And how are we make certain, how are we making certain that we're capitalizing on that? Next slide. So when we talk about entrepreneurships, you know, um, ecosystems, by most definitions, that really refers to a strategic alignment of a variety of public and private efforts. So including government policies, funding, finance, human capital, and regulatory frameworks to provide the necessary financial, social, and human capital to really foster entrepreneurship in an innovative and creative way. That's a, you know, a definition that Babson College developed over 20 years ago. But what Main Streets really bring in is the emphasis on the creation and support of great places, spaces for people to live, work. And those commercial districts are those places. Remember the value of place. I think that's always the piece that's missing when we think about entrepreneurship ecosystems. Next slide. So enough from me. You, you all hear me talk all the time. I'm gonna turn it over to our fantastic presenters today. Um, I am pleased to be joined by Alicia Gallo, Executive Director of Richmond Main Street and from Richmond, California. Brianne Dornbush, Executive Director of D District Bridges in Washington, DC. And of course, Deshaya G, who is now a National Main Street Center board member, but past Executive Director of the Martin Luther King Drive bid in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, he hasn't told us what his fancy new title is, but he has switched over to the development world. Uh, so we're not sure where he's working, but he is these, all three of these individuals are a source of great information. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia to sh you know, showcase what Richmond, California has been doing to support their uh, entrepreneurs. Alicia. Thank you so much, Dion. Um, Yes, my name is Alicia Gallo. Um, slight correction, I'm actually the interim executive director here at Richmond Main Street in Richmond, California. Um, next slide, please. So, so to start, I'd like to paint a picture of, of what our Main Street is. Um, McDonald Avenue is our Main Street um, and our district footprint is about 10 blocks wide or long by four streets wide. We are home to a transit hub 
So, and it's called the Richmond Transit Station. Uh, it's one of only two intermodal stations in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it has three transit agencies that provide direct service, a nearby hospital, hospital and a few local employer shuttles that also use the station as a drop-off pickup zone. Um, there's a connector to the San Francisco Bay Ferry. Um, we also have long-term bike parking and two brand new e-bike share hubs. And by the end of the year, our district will also have an electric vehicle car share access points and stops along a new electric vehicle um, on-demand shuttle. So basically, there's a lot of mobility, a lot of people coming in and out of our downtown. Um, Pre-pandemic, there were about 8,000 um, commuters using the transit station. So I, I mentioned that to kind of paint a picture of um, the, the kind of market opportunities, the customer opportunities that our small businesses serve. Um, and we are, of course, are an urban Maine um, district. We are located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we're across the Bay from San Francisco in the East Bay. We're just north of Oakland and west of the Sacramento Valley. So we have a very high density area, um, very diverse hyper-connected to other metropolitan um, and uh, semi-rural communities. So a lot of people, again, moving in and out, lots of connections to a lot of different people. Um, and in terms of our district, uh, we also manage the downtown Richmond PBID, which is a property-based um, improvement district, uh, which shares the same exact boundaries as our downtown core. Um, and within that context, our stakeholdership consists of about 35 property owners and about 100 commercial uh, tenant entities. Um, and in terms of our history as a community, um, we do have a very strong home front heritage. So during World War II, Richmond was home to Kaiser Shipyards. Uh, this industry resulted in Richmond's population growing from about 23,000 people in 1940 to over 100,000 people in 1945. Um, and a good portion of that population growth were um, white folks and African-Americans originating from the South and Southwest. Um, so really true melting pot, you know, community here in our heritage of downtown during its heyday. Um, and so during that time, the development along McDonald Avenue really exploded um, and our commercial corridor became, you know, the city's downtown. And in fact, one of our hotels acted as um, almost like a city hall. It was the largest space that could hold people uh, for that reason it's on our national uh, registry of historic places. Um, and almost from the beginning, we've been a black business hub. Um, so uh, especially starting in the 40s, um, there were a number of um, black businesses and professionals. Um, and as they were developing their businesses um, at that time and through the 60s in particular, these same individuals developed a network and worked to build community, support aspiring entrepreneurs and to elect African-Americans to local uh, political positions. Um, you know, unfortunately, from the 60s to the 90s, our downtown experienced a decline, much like a lot of other, you know, urban cores with the, um, you know, suburbanization movement. Um, and uh, when a mall was built outside of the district, um, just east of us, all of the anchor businesses relocated to that newly built mall that's called Hilltop. Um, and unfortunately, we saw an increase of crime, a high criminalization of people of color um, and low income folks. Um, and then unfortunately also during this time, you know, urban renewal projects tore down a lot of our historic buildings. But the good news is that there's a Richmond Renaissance in the works. We are of course at the heart of that. Um, we've been doing this work since the early 2000s. Um, and we're definitely starting to see, you know, the culmination of all of the hard work with the Renaissance and entrepreneurship, placemaking activities, design, um, and the changing of the narrative work that we've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, and some numbers I'd like to share with you in terms of our business community, we have about 88 small independent businesses and the ownership demographic um, I have on the slide here. So you can see we have a vast majority of businesses that are small or even micro enterprises um, and are also minority owned as defined by the SBA. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier, you know, the majority of our businesses are micro businesses or solopreneurs. Um, they are family run, average staff size of, you know, three to five. And what this means for us is that they're super busy. 
and they're, they don't have a lot of extra time. Um, so in addition to sending out updates and information via email, um, we've really invested time into developing and maintaining a really strong database system and email marketing platform um, that has been very effective for us. But especially during COVID-19, we really learned that you know, we had to up our game if I'm being truthful, around meeting the businesses where they were at. And so what that looks like for us is that we will actually physically distribute information packets. Um, we, we utilize our neighborhood ambassadors to assist with that work, but us as our staff uh, will also go out and physically distribute the latest updates around COVID-19 protocols, um, small business resources. Um, and we really also invest a lot in doing the legwork of uh, educating ourselves on what those updates are, what resources are available, um, and to translate them into easier to understand kind of bite-sized formats um, and to distribute that information both regularly and consistently to our businesses. The other thing, a uh, challenge that we experience here that our, we noticed that um, you know, a challenge with our small businesses is that the digital divide is real and it's very real. Um, and even in the Bay Area, which is this huge industry and this huge you know, hub of technological innovation. Um, a lot of those uh, you know, innovations that occur down in Silicon Valley don't necessarily um, make it to the folks that, that we serve. You know, many of our businesses don't have a web presence. Um, they are not very active um, online due to not having sufficient time, capacity or expertise. And so to help address that, we've made um, providing web presence, social media marketing, and e-commerce technical assistance available to our businesses, um, as well as using our own digital platforms to um, promote them on, you know, on their behalf, um, both individually as well as you know, all the businesses together. Another challenge that uh, we uh, continually have um, and that we work on very diligently is cleanliness and safety, both real and perceived. Um, so our, our community consistently identifies cleanliness, crime, and homelessness as top priorities, um, both in terms of you know, the district um, for the, the entire community, residents and visitors, but we also see that as an economic development vitality indicator as well. Um, and so in order to address this need, about 50% of our PVID budget goes towards providing neighborhood ambassador services. Um, and our main street approach, we've included a clean and safe committee as well, um, which we utilize to help maintain strong working relationships with um, our county's homeless outreach team, as well as our local police department. Um, and all of our businesses. And then we also will host events designed to activate downtown and to invite residents and visitors to come out. A lot of times their perception of what downtown is and what it looks like is very different from reality. So our placemaking community events are an important uh, component to helping to um, change that narrative and to invite people downtown so they can discover for themselves all the fantastic businesses that we have here. Um, we also are, have you know, a bit of a financial services desert. Our, our downtown unfortunately doesn't have a bank um, and access to affordable working capital is a huge need for our small businesses. Many of them tap into their personal networks for um, startup and growth capital. And in order to help fill this gap, we host access to capital workshops. We refer folks to our local community bank. Uh, which is our preferred bank. Uh, and we have also worked in partnership with our city's um, revolving loan fund program, as well as we became a Kiva trustee a number of years ago um, and have supported three businesses being able to receive loans through that platform. Um, and then of course, the doing business bureaucracy is really challenging. Both city, county and state business permitting and compliance regulations are very confusing and they can be quite expensive. So we make extra efforts to maintain strong working relationships with those agencies to educate ourselves on those topics, how those things work, and to also advocate um, for a more streamlined affordable processes for our businesses. Um, and we often serve as a navigator and advocate for our businesses and property owners who are working through that process. Um, maybe they've submitted an application, they haven't heard back. 
So if we know who's at that department, we'll send them a note and be like, hey, what's going on with X, Y, and Z? And sometimes we are able to get a little bit more of a speedy response that way. Um, next slide, please. And so kind of the, the key takeaways that I have in terms of how we have developed our program to support small businesses, and in particular, you know, our um, historically disadvantaged or disenfranchised businesses is um, kind of going back to the core and the basics of the Main Street approach. Um, so I, I won't read them out loud, but um, I, I would like to explain a little bit behind these, these three pictures here, which we see as incredible success stories over the past couple of years. The first photo of the gentleman with the bike that says Rich in the hoodie that says Rich City, Masnajari Smith, he's the co-owner of Rich City Rides Bike Skate Co-op Shop. This is Richmond's only bike shop. It's cooperative, it's black owned, um, it's located in our downtown. We actually became a Kiva trustee in part to help him access capital needed in order to open the shop um, and specifically a location that was in downtown. And then they successfully did raise those, those funds. They paid back the loan and they have since taken out a second one and repaid that one as well. Um, and their shop is thriving and it's an anchor business on a corner that was previously very neglected. The second photo on the right um, is uh, what's called a whisper room. It's a recording booth, uh, Rich City Studios, uh, which is located in our district in a historic building. They were able to acquire one of these units as an investment in their business. Um, and as a COVID um, uh, kind of uh, response, thanks to being awarded a heartbeat of Main Street COVID-19 relief grant last year, we heavily promoted this opportunity to all of our businesses and we wrote a number of letters of support, including Rich City Studios. And so we were very happy to see them um, as a recipient and being able to put those dollars and invest into their, their business. Um, and the third photo is a ribbon cutting um, for the Richmond Business Hub, which is a 10,000 square foot space that was vacant for nearly eight years. Um, long story short, our community told us that what they wanted was more food options, they wanted business incubator spaces, and they wanted more third spaces for gathering, um, especially at night and on the weekends. Uh, we made this a priority. We had a lot of challenges, detours, and pivot points, et cetera, to make this happen. But ultimately, we were successful in bringing together a lot of stakeholders and bringing investment dollars to build this hub, which is now home to CoBiz Richmond, which is a co-working business incubator and event space, as well as a food hall. Um, and so that is concludes my portion of the presentation. And I will pass the mic back over to the moderators. Thank you, Alicia. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, great work. We're gonna turn it over now to Brianne Dornbush to tell us a little bit more about District Bridges and what they're doing in Washington, DC. Thanks, Dion. And thanks for inviting me to speak today. This is uh, really exciting. Um, as Dion mentioned, I'm Brianne Dornbush. I'm Executive Director of District Bridges. Um, our vision is to thrive in, community, in equitable communities, resilient, connected communities here in DC and beyond. You want to move over to the next slide? So District Bridges, uh, we got started out of a very grassroots community effort, which was a, a local community festival called the Columbia Heights Day Festival, started with a bunch of neighbors back in 2005. And after about 10 years of successful festivals, we developed an organization um, to manage a, a Main Street program. And this was a unique Main Street program here in, in the district. It was for two very distinct neighborhoods, Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant. And so we, out of that, developed a multi-Main Street model and we now manage seven of DC's 26 Main Street programs. And the whole goal of this multi-Main Street model was really to build the capacity of the individual programs. Um, we now serve over 10 neighborhoods with about a thousand businesses across each of those neighborhoods. Um, each of the neighborhoods is very distinct and unique. They face different challenges, um, all within a very um, complex urban environment. And so we are able to, we have a full-time staff member for each one of our Main Street programs, and they focus on those 
specific businesses within their designated corridors. And so we have um, U Street, Main Street, which is a very historic um, Main Street in the district. It's one of the newer Main Streets, it was established in 2019, um, right before the pandemic hit. Logan Circle and Cleveland Park were also established that year. So the traditional Main Street model where you're hitting the ground, meeting businesses, really trying to develop that trust um, was very challenging during the pandemic, but we also found that businesses were desperate for that support. And we were really able to find some new ways to meet businesses where they're at throughout that pandemic. Um, we also, each one of our neighborhoods has very different priorities. Our Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant Main Streets and the, our Lower Georgia Avenue Main Streets are really experiencing rapid gentrification and the, the demographics of the the residents who are living in those communities have changed over the last two, three years drastically. And so while the business landscape maybe has not changed as rapidly, and so we've really had to come up with some unique ways to serve those businesses and meet them where they're at while their customer bases are changing, while we're seeing sometimes um, predatory development practices. And so it's really taken a, a collaborative approach to strengthening the small business ecosystem to help these businesses survive. We've often found that um, community development work falls into two camps. One, either the theoretical with amazing possibilities or the practical where you have everybody working as hard as they can to make things move forward. And so we're really trying to bring those two, two practices together. Um, to have a more holistic approach to community development. You want to move to the next slide? Um, again, we leverage our collective expertise. One of the things that we found over the last year was a lot of the small, a lot of the Main Street programs here in DC, they are single, they have one executive director moving the weight of the world and a lot of small businesses trying to help support them, particularly during a very challenging time in the pandemic world. And so we've really been looking to how can we increase our capacity? How can we help strengthen the small business ecosystem? And I think um, webinars like this one right now are exactly what is so important of making those connections, learning from others, and really trying to strengthen our collective expertise and tools so that we can do this work more effectively and more sustainably and really reach more businesses. If you wanna to move to the next slide. So uh, <laughs> right before the pandemic, we had started a strategic planning process. And what was supposed to be a two month process ended up taking us about eight months. Um, so we did that throughout the pandemic. And we ultimately boiled down three ultimate outcomes that are all of our Main Street programs and as an organization, District Bridges is moving towards. And the first one being equitably strengthened and connected communities with a strong sense of place. The second was sustainable and self-determined businesses. And the third was human scale corridor, commercial corridors with vibrant valued businesses. Some of the things that I think are particularly important when we talk about um, equitable service and really helping connect the business owners um, with the services that they need, it's really understanding what how they need to accept, access that training, those resources. And it's not, it's not the same for every single business. Our Columbia Heights Mount Pleasant program um, has a large immigrant population, um, very large Latino population, Spanish speaking. And so for those businesses, language access is really critically important. We found that when it came to grant applications, if they weren't translated, if they didn't have support in actually putting together an application in their native language, they often never even applied. Or there was a, a cultural disconnect where the, the understanding of, is this, is this really a grant or do I have to pay this back? Is this a loan? Not really having that true understanding. And so we saw a lot of businesses, our minority owned businesses who needed the support the most, missing out on those opportunities because our ecosystem lacked those um, supports for those businesses. And so when we think about equitable um, support, it's 
figuring out what the business with the greatest need needs to make sure that those um, services can be provided. On the other side is self-determined. So making sure that the business has a say in, in what kind of support they get. Not every business wants to grow and be a multi, um, multi-unit building or you know have multiple locations, franchise, anything like that. Sometimes they just wanna do what they're doing and they're happy being that a, a small micro business. And so really making sure that they have a say in the kind of support that they get. And so we, we really work on helping them develop their specific goals. And so one of the things that we're looking at, particularly in rapidly gentrifying communities is if a business owner wants to stay, they need to be given the opportunity to do so. And we need to provide supports for that to happen. And so we've developed a program called our Business Preservation Assistance Program. And that's looking at helping business owners actually purchase their buildings, sometimes through mixed use redevelopments, sometimes working with their landlords to find um, reasonable lease negotiation, um, so really making sure that if they want to stay there, that they have the opportunity to. If they want to close their business, that's also an option. They don't have to stay in that same place. If they're looking for new locations, that's also an option. But really putting the, the ownership on the business, letting them determine their future and giving them the, the power and resources to do so. And then um, the human scaled corridors. That's something uh, we really went back and forth with this language of the human scale when you're walking down the street, when you're walking into the small businesses. Um, sometimes I think development looks at the big picture and we want to look at the big picture. That's very important, particular, particularly when we're looking at policy and how that impacts how development is happening in the city at large, but really making sure that we're developing places, we're helping support businesses that are serving the people that live there. And so we have also been working with um, our programs to develop um, programs based on what that community wants. So community surveys and business surveys to really understand how businesses can adapt, how they can change to really meet the needs that are of the, in that community. And as those communities change, how they can adapt to make sure that they continue to thrive. Another thing that happened um, Prior to the pandemic, we started developing our Access Point program, which is an online technical assistance platform, which was based because we found that a lot of small businesses, they were telling us they needed a certain type of workshop or training, and then we would provide that and they wouldn't show up. And we'd go back and say, why, why weren't you able to come to the workshop that you desperately needed? And they're like, well, I can't, I can't leave my business. I'd have to close. And we're like, oh, okay. So by providing that online, they can do it at their own pace, um, in their own native language. They can do it when it's convenient for them from their phone, in their store if they need to. And so by really taking the technical assistance to them, um, we're, we're meeting them where they're at. Um, that We started planning that prior to um, COVID and now that has been even more important as we've, we've seen the impacts of, of the pandemic. And do you want to move to the next slide? So another thing that we think is particularly important is moving at the speed of trust. For these businesses, um, a lot of times they've had other, other groups come in who may or may not have helped and supported them. Um, we have businesses that have been pushed out because they, they weren't given the support that they needed. And so really it's about showing up, being consistent, um, listening, first and foremost. And so, you know, these programs are really meant to um, build on that trust. And so you can only do that over time. And so we're constantly advocating for these programs to really provide more dedicated time on the ground with businesses. During the pandemic, sometimes that meant literally taping um, postcards to doors to say, I don't have your contact information. You don't use email, call me, text me, I can help. And so it really is making sure that the, the business that is least likely to get help through the traditional methods that we are accessing, uh, we're getting them access to that support. And innovating and adapting. Uh, if it means, uh, if in-person has been the traditional way, sometimes we had to do that in the park and 
figure out how we could adapt our, our services to really meet the needs during this really challenging time, helping uh, businesses with the PPP loans or the idle loans, whatever that looked like, um, and, and really building our internal capacity. And so now we're really focused on, on helping build that across DC Main Street so that we're all able to provide that support. Um, right now, our access point platform, it's it is available to all businesses in DC. We're really hoping to promote it through the main streets first um, and then really start targeting other businesses because we know that not all businesses fall within a business improvement district or a main street program. And so for those businesses that aren't within one of those entities and don't have that one-on-one -on -one technical support, it's really about building the ecosystem so that they can find their way to the supports and resources that they need so that we really can continue to see the recovery of the, the small business ecosystem here in DC grow and really be as thriving as, as it possibly can be. And I think that's all of my slides. Yeah, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk about that after. Awesome, thank you, Brianne, so much for that presentation. I have some questions that I've jotted down, so I'll make sure that I ask them at the end. Um, last but not least, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Deshay Aji, I'm consultant and former executive director with the King Drive Main Street in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you this, uh, today. Uh, Dion's chair that I have, um, moved to a new position. I am now the uh, vice president at a MEM group, a design build development firm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I wanted to be able to share some of my experience uh, working with the Historic King Drive bid for the um, little more than five years I was there. A little bit about the bid first before I talk about the programs and the grants and how we've been able to work uh, to build a, a vibrant neighborhood the business improvement district number eight uh, is one of over 30 business improvement districts in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, our area is about four miles covering all of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive here in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, business improvement districts uh, similar to special service areas. Uh, we work with property owners and businesses. Uh, we are an advocate on their behalf. Uh, working to help them access resources and technical assistance to uh, improve not only their business, but to see properties revitalized. Uh, we have a goal in the area that we call uh, zero vacancy. And what zero vacancy is essentially is no vacant land, no vacant buildings. Um, here in Milwaukee, we've been working to build the best King Drive in the nation. And it has taken a lot of partnerships, including with the city, uh, philanthropy, property owners, businesses, residents, uh, in order to make sure that our Dr. Martin Luther King Drive uh, does not have the experience that some other Dr. Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Drives have throughout the nation. Uh, and that is a stigma of being blight, uh, blighted and uh, in some cases, uh, disinvestment. Uh, beautification is something that we've strived to make sure that we can ensure the area remains clean, uh, free of graffiti, and uh, as well as uh, debris. Uh, we provided a lot of technical assistance to, to businesses in accessing grants from the city of Milwaukee, uh, as well as business recruitment uh, for our uh, property owners and also those uh, businesses that are throughout the city who have decided that they would like to uh, expand in some way uh, or locate in our business improvement district. Uh, we support catalytic projects. There are a couple of new developments that have come online in the area. Uh, one of them is a $100 million redevelopment of a uh, former Gimbel Schuster's department store. If anyone remember Schuster's, we had a 400,000 square foot building that is now being converted to offices, class A offices for our medical college of Wisconsin, as well as a, one of our largest philanthropic organizations here, which is the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And that development will also include uh, residential units. Um, over 70 apartment units will be a part of that project. We've also had another philanthropic agency located in our area called Bader Philanthropies. Not only did they locate their corporate office from our downtown area uh, into our neighborhood, but they also purchased a building that is 
um, recently converted to a place called uh, Sam's Cafe, uh, where it is a hub for jazz in the neighborhood. Uh, I know uh, Sandra is, is a great singer of jazz, uh, having had some experience with her at an event. So I uh, always would like to you know, make sure that we have our artists in our neighborhoods. Uh, we have uh, artists uh, programming that are also a part of our business improvement district. And we also support a program called Brew City Match. If you all have, have heard of Motor City Match, our Brew City Match is modeled after our um, understanding of what Motor City Match was in Detroit. And essentially that's a program that uh, was for and is for uh, business owners, property owners, and we essentially have several tracks. Uh, you see those tracks there listed, a business owner track, a building owner track, as well as our business resources. So on the business owner track that you see here, uh, it is for those who are interested in locating in the district and we provide resources to help them activate vacant commercial spaces. Uh, and we also provide that level of support for the property owners as well. Um, here in Milwaukee, Chase Bank, um, essentially provided a $200,000 seed grant to see how the Brew City Match could uh, be piloted in the neighborhood. We started with a pop-up program uh, that you see there called Pop-Up MKE. And that Pop-Up MKE provided uh, space, uh, low-cost space, and initially it was no-cost space to businesses that were uh, testing their business model to see how their business model coming from a home environment uh, or from a um, more so uh, event only environment to a brick and mortar uh, to see how they could really expand their customer base in order to eventually go into a, a space of their own. And with that uh, pilot program, uh, with the success that came with it, Chase Bank provided a full grant to uh, LISC Local Initiative Support Corporation here in Milwaukee. Uh, in the amount of $3.5 million. That $3.5 million grant has now been expanded to several other neighborhoods here in Milwaukee. And now we have uh, five neighborhoods that are utilizing this particular program to grow uh, small businesses right in our neighborhood. Uh, and in order to, to do so, we are providing grants of various sources, uh, uh, um, sorry, of various types. Um, and it's leveraging other sources of funding throughout our neighborhood. And what that does essentially is activate not just the spaces uh, that are vacant, but it also provides opportunity and hope for those uh, entrepreneurs that have desired to be in business and are creating jobs. We also understood that with COVID last year, there was um, a significant amount of impact, not only here in Milwaukee, but I'm sure in your communities as well. And we reprogrammed some of those funds that were dedicated to activating commercial spaces to provide some uh, rent relief and some staff assistance um, uh, in terms of being able to use those funds to, to pay staff. Uh, those businesses access uh, upwards of $35,000 to be able to not only stay open, but to keep their uh, employees uh, in place uh, at the beginning of COVID. The grants are also available for marketing uh, as well as uh, small grants for inventory and uh, space redesign. And so uh, Brew City Match has been a huge help right here in Milwaukee. And we uh, encourage any community to look at their local initiative support corporation or philanthropy uh, found that here in Milwaukee, uh, our ph philanthropic uh, organizations have really supported uh, the work that we've done in our business improvement district and in our main street. And as a member of uh, Urban Maine, we, we know how it is important to really highlight and utilize those uh, four approaches to uh, economic development and co uh, community uh, revitalization. Uh, next slide, please. One of those programs that we also wanted to highlight was what we did for businesses last year during COVID. Uh, again, we have a number of businesses in our business improvement district, uh, over uh, 100 business improvement districts. We have 300 properties that are within our boundaries. Uh, and we extend four miles again on our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Uh, 
when this uh, is shared. If it's shared as a, a PDF, you will have a map that includes what our full boundary is. But I wanted to just highlight again what our programming is and this idea of a cash mob. Uh, you all may have done something like this or may be interested in trying a, a tool uh, called uh, a cash mob where you highlight several businesses uh, and provide them the support that they need, as well as the uh, push uh, from a marketing perspective to drive traffic to their businesses. And what we did was pick seven, I'm sorry, uh, eight of our businesses and gave them all of the tools that they needed uh, in order to have a successful sales day. And what that included was our, our promotions, not just via uh, flyers and posters. We also ran radio advertising and we also uh, used our social media as well as promoted this through our um, partnerships with our local uh, tourism bureau. And we wanted to make sure that those businesses really had a chance to ha have a successful day. I think what we found during COVID when everyone had to close down, it really impacted you know, businesses in a way where we did lose two businesses. Um, I think we could have lost a lot more if there wasn't some support that was wrapped around them. And um, this also included grants on the day of the event. So not only did they have the ability to uh, promote the businesses um, uh, event that day themselves, we also promoted it in a lot of ways, as well as provided them a grant on the day of the event that was more of a surprise to them, they didn't know. And so we anticipate doing that again this year. Uh, we're going to do 12 businesses and we're going to provide a, a stipend of a little bit more money than, than what we, we provided last year because we realize businesses are still being impacted right now. Next slide. I shared that our uh, philanthropic uh, donations and contributions to our business improvement district are uh, at, a, at an all time high here in the bid um, can share that with uh, several of our, not just events, but uh, several of our initiatives like our uh, pop-up program, our initiative to revitalize a one acre park that's in our community called Victory Over Violence Park. We were able to raise a significant amount of funds. We raised over $40,000 from AARP. Again, I encourage you all to find your local uh, philanthropic organizations and those that are supporting a commercial corridor revitalization. Uh, AARP provided $40,000 for us to be able to pay for a new stage at the park, as well as solar bollards and, and furniture. Uh, this park called Victory Over Violence Park is a place where families have gone to deal with violence uh, and actually heal. So that park includes uh, new walkways, uh, new walking paths, um, uh, a little bit of our, our uh, urban planning uh, relative to uh, plantings and um, a significant amount of redesign with this particular park. Um, I don't have the image here, but I wanted to be able to kind of highlight that a little bit because all of that type of work uh, in addition to the business recruitment provided the philanthropic uh, community in the city of Milwaukee, the uh, understanding of the work we were doing and gave them insight into what we would like to see happen in our neighborhood. And it led to uh, loan programs that uh, you see here. One of them is a, divert, a deferred payment loan that Greater Milwaukee Foundation who was moving into our district uh, basically created its own uh, funding for businesses to be able to access. It's a loan that's uh, priced at 2%. Uh, there is a 20-year uh, amortization on these funds. It also offers uh, no payment um, for the first 12 months and also uh, no um, prepayment penalty. So again, this is a different type of tool that we haven't seen here in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, and most organizations, I think, may see something like this and, and think, you know, how, how does one get, um, you know, a, a, a way to really be successful in business? And Great Milwaukee Foundation chose our neighborhood, uh, Harambe, Brewers Hill, and Howyer Park to launch this particular tool. And it's only available in our district. 
So I would encourage you all to identify, if you can, any philanthropic partners in your communities that will be interested in uh, supporting the work that you're doing in your neighborhood and creating a tool similar. Again, this is a 2% loan uh, amortized over 20 years, no prepayment penalty, no interest, uh, no payment for the first 12 months. And it's up to $50,000 which we saw as a huge benefit to our businesses. Uh, the uh, closing period was just this past Friday and they informed us that they would like to have all of that million dollars that they have set aside deployed into, into the neighborhood. You also see a loan fund with the bid of $10,000 or up to $10,000 also at 2%. That is something that uh, the Business Improvement District worked with the local bank, uh, North Shore Bank to create. And that is a, a tool that we contributed $25,000 toward, as well as the bank contributed $25,000 toward. And our uh, local organization called Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation is administering uh, that particular fund. And the last one you see here is through a CDFI, a uh, Community Development Financial Inst Institution uh, called a Legacy Redevelopment Corporation. The city of Milwaukee uh, provided uh, them a, a significant amount of funds to be able to do something uh, similar, not just in our neighborhoods, but in different parts of the city of Milwaukee. Again, another a loan fund with a low interest. Uh, we know that during COVID also, a lot of the predatory lenders uh, found opportunities to um, uh, make their funds available. And so we have now three different loan funds that are available in addition to Brew City Match, in addition to the bid having its own uh, incentive grant for property owners and businesses where they can access um, these funds, again, as a grant to improve buildings, to have funding, to market themselves and do things like our cash mob. So I just wanted to highlight several of our initiatives here in Milwaukee, uh, and thank you all for being with us today. I'm here to answer any questions as well. Wow, what great presenters. Thank you, Alicia, Brianne, and, and Deshay. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna kick off the questions uh, really quick. I don't see us being flooded with questions in the chat. But if you do have questions, please list your, your question in the chat box. Um, what, what I've heard that's resoundingly clear and common uh, amongst all three of your presentations, or that is a clear line throughout three of your presentations, is public-private partnership. So having a partnership with city government, having a partnership with the philanthropic or, um, entities, but as well as having a desire to really bring back equity and, and support small independent businesses. My question is, you know, you guys all are, are focused on equity focused programs. Is there legislation? And it seems that way, but is there legislation um, that supports these type of efforts within city government? You know, Deanna, I'll jump in. I think that uh, when we think about how local communities operate, um, that legislation comes through either our state government, our county government, or our uh, city or town or village government. And in Milwaukee, I can say that things like our uh, MKE Business Now Entrepreneurship Summit, things that are made citywide uh, events, um, that type of legislation that also provides um, support for um, those who are providing that technical assistance uh, for the businesses, that, that is one way that I think our, our local um, city government has has legislated being able to uh, provide equity and um, you know equitable economic development in in our city. Um, I know that at at the state level, you'll see uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, the We're All In grant uh, was one grant that came through our state government to support our uh, local businesses again in, in an equitable way. Um, there is a focus 
with that nonprofit, um, Greater Milwaukee Foundation that, that you saw there. Um, and they specifically highlighted with that million dollars, black and brown businesses uh, are being prioritized. You know, so I know we've seen it here in Milwaukee where it has been at the state level, at the city level with uh, another form of we're all in grant. Um, and I've seen it not so much at the county level yet, uh, but we know that we have a new county executive, um, African American, um, first African American county executive here in uh, Milwaukee County, who also has uh, an intent to ensure that there is uh, equity as relates to uh, the the business uh, environment here in Milwaukee. And you'll see uh, some of our grants that are maybe. Um, uh, incentivized through the, the state, but uh, the legislation has to go through the county or the city. And so we, we've seen that as well, uh, where the funds may be available at the state level, uh, but are going through uh, one of our other um, legislative arms, either our county government or our city government. And um, they have provided, again, another level of support uh, in addition to the, the philanthropic arm. But overall, as, as you shared, Dion, it, it is about equitable economic development. I think people know now that um, there may not have always been an equal playing field for um, everyone to get into business, uh, but um, there have been many, many more efforts in the last couple of years uh, to ensure that that is the case. You know, Deshay, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned that that AARP actually gave you all a grant. I was, I don't know if others were, but I wasn't even aware that AARP gave out grants. Yeah, AARP Wisconsin provided, um, they, they, they had an open grant. And so, um, you know, thankfully, um, you know, we, we had a project that they supported. Uh, and again, AARP, if, if you really look at every organization that provide some form of grant, uh, they have goals that they would like to meet. And so we ensure that, you know, the, the park that, that we're developing will be ADA accessible. Uh, it's a park for all ages. And we, we wanted to be sure that uh, the, the goal of bringing that park back, not just to life, but to ensure that it, it hit the mission of being able to uh, support families dealing with violence. I think uh, all of those things were uh, what, you know, AARP looked at and said, you know, how, how can we support that? And um, that $40,000 grant was the, the largest grant that they've awarded to, um, uh, I'm sorry, that they've awarded in the city of Milwaukee. And that was our first time applying. So I, I would encourage you all to, you know, just kind of look and see what funding sources are, are out there. Um, either again, from philanthropy, you know, organizations like AARP, um, your city government. And, you know, I think uh, I have the benefit of having worked in city government for uh, more than nine years prior to being at the bid five and a half years to, to know how, um, how to leverage different sources that may be available. And again, that's something I would encourage everyone to, you know, make, make some phone calls and get to know those in, in, in the philanthropic sector, as well as uh, those who are in city government, because they, there are goals that, that they want to meet and, and they will work with you in order to help you reach yours, mm -hmm. as long as you're helping them reach theirs. Thank you, Deshay. But before before you guys, I'm going to um, just drop the AARP community grants in the chat. Um, that's available to everybody. Um, and, but what I, I do, I think it's really important that we talk about this policy piece. And the reason that I'm staying here um, is because I'm in a place where policy is being made to stop equitable economic development. And it is very important regardless of whatever you know, projects you may come up with, if your city or state is not backing that or they've legislated that it's illegal to, prefer, to provide preferential um, set-asides for black and brown businesses that have been left behind, I, I would love to hear from both Brianne and Alicia if they had those type of partnerships with their city government or state government before we move on, but I will drop that AARP information in the chat for you. Yeah, I'll, so DC is a unique environment. Uh, we are not a state, hopefully someday we will be um, 51st, but 
right now we're not. And so that, that presents unique challenges. We don't have a state legislature where our, our city council acts as our, our state legislature, if there were an equivalent. Um, one thing that RDC council has done was last year they established CORE, which is the Council Office for Racial Equity. Um, I think one thing when it comes to policy, a lot of times the policymakers are not in direct contact with the people they are putting policies in place for. So the reason that I think main streets are so critical to a healthy ecosystem of community development is because we have those direct relationships with the small businesses. So again, going back to what I spoke about earlier of moving at the speed of trust for, for black and brown business owners who have been disenfranchised over and over and have had that trust continually diminished and, and broken, it takes a, a considerable amount of time and effort to really establish trusted relationships with them. And so then when you go to policymakers and you're speaking on those businesses behalf, they know that you have their best interest at heart. And, and that takes a lot of time and effort to do. Um, you know, not only reversing some of the policies that have been put in place, it's, it's not just about recognizing the, the history that has predated these current, um, the, the current environment that we're in, but actually actively trying to restore those businesses that have been disenfranchised. So looking at those grant opportunities, again, looking at access. So when there are language barriers, when there are wealth gaps of, of how do we get access to those business owners who have not been given the same opportunities because of systemic racism, because of white supremacy the, the, that is embedded in our system, we have to actively put that into consideration as we're going to our policymakers and actively trying to get small business policies enacted that will create the advantages for those businesses because they are absolutely critical to preserving cultural um, integrity of our neighborhoods and, and that framework or that fabric of our communities that is so important. And so um, I, I think really establishing those relationships, Dion, what you spoke about, about, about the public-private partnership, um, we found that a lot of times um, during COVID particularly, these grants were coming out and um, you know, one grant in particular, it was a winterization grant and it was not reimbursable and it came out in October. By October, most of the businesses who were preparing for winter had already done their preparations. And so a lot of businesses were not able to take advantage of that. And it was as simple as adding reimbursable to the language within the grant. And so having those connections between those policymakers who are establishing these kind of emergency programs or these opportunities for the small businesses is so critical because if they don't understand the particular need and the particular um, barriers that those businesses experience, the, the policy will be, be ineffective and, and will continue to propagate a lot of those um, exclusionary practices that have been, you know, were originally intentional. And now because of the, the disconnect between the, the policymakers and the actual people on the ground is an unintentional consequence. But that's where I think main streets have and, and bids and, and SIDS and all of those. I think that's where we have a unique opportunity to say, we can do this better, but we have to create those connections, those intentional relationships between policymakers and the entities who are on the ground working with these small businesses. Yeah, I, I, I agree and co-sign and amplify everything that <laughs> Brianne has just said. Um, it sounds very, very familiar and similar to, um, you know, the interaction between policymakers and philanthropy in California and in particular in the city of Richmond. Um, the city of Richmond staff, uh, a small working group of staff and some nonprofit community-based partners have been working with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity for a number of years. Um, uh, if folks go to racialequityalliance.org, they can learn more about this group and their process. Um, and uh, they've been working on advocating for um, diversity, equity, inclusion workshops um, for city departments, especially city department heads who are very involved with um, you know, the policy making as well as budgeting for those departments. Um, 
because that disconnect is very real, where oftentimes the people who are making those decisions do not have the lived experience of the folks that they are, you know, serving um, professionally and that we are, you know, working really boots on the ground with. Um, and so we are encouraged by this process. It's very slow, unfortunately. Um, but one of the, the four focus areas that has risen to the top um, with this process is uh, equitable procurement practices. Um, so changing the city of Richmond's policies to include a, you know, a percentage of procurement needs to be from Richmond based businesses or, you know, businesses that are owned by you know, black owned or women owned or minority owned or, you know, those SBA, you know, identifiers of minority owned. So we're really encouraged that that has come to the forefront. Um, we identified that as a, a growth opportunity and a preservation in place opportunity for businesses with a variety of anchor institutions in the community um, and have we have done some technical excuse me assistance workshops around that so we're hopeful that that will be put in place with the city of Richmond. Um, and we also are, you know, we have very strong relationships. We work really hard to have really good working relationships with a variety of departments, both municipal and county, um, and to make sure to bring that advocacy piece into all the conversations that we have. Um, we are often invited to, invite, to participate in planning processes. Um, and so we always make sure to share the experiences that we have had serving our business community, as well as the experiences that our business community has in working through the various you know, frameworks and structures of departments and permitting and things like that. Um, and access, especially language inclusion, is really, really big. We um, have a growing um, Latinx demographic in the city of Richmond, and a lot of folks who, you know, Spanish is their primary language or their most comfortable language to speak and do business with. And so, um, you know, making sure that there's translation interpretation services available, that information, uh, you know, flyers are in Spanish. But not only that, but at the meeting that there are interpretation services available in those languages as well. So if the city is, for example, looking to publish all of their documents and all of their flyers in the top three languages spoken in the community, well, then those applications, say for a COVID relief grant, those need to be made available in those languages as well. So sometimes it, we are the, the voice at the table that says, well, hey, have you is that is you know Spanish going to be provided? Are the are the panelists going to be speaking Spanish for this workshop? Well, if not, well then you know why have a Spanish language flyer for it? So you're advertising something that's not actually going to be provided. That doesn't quite make sense. Um, and then in terms of philanthropy. Um, California has, I think, probably like the largest number of nonprofits um, in the entire state or the, the, the country. Um, and so, uh, you know, relationships with philanthropy can be a little challenging in terms of there's just so many causes, and so many needs. Um, one thing that I was encouraged by, uh, you know, last year in response to a lot, you know, all of the social justice movements and, um, you know, that activity was that we did see some funders in particular in the Bay Area, you know, make announcements about uh, special funds to support CDFIs and nonprofit organizations working to support black owned and minority owned businesses. Um, unfortunately, the rollout of those funds has been very slow. Um, that's something that I am not very happy about and that every opportunity that I have to make connections with um, those uh, decision makers, to have conversations with the movers and the shakers in the philanthropy world is to bring that up, um, as well as to stick by our integrity of being authentic to who we are and who we represent. We, um, I mentioned earlier, we often do get, you know, invitations for, you know, hey, we're doing this mapping project to create this policy plan of how we can support, you know, minority owned businesses, um, which I think is great. Um, but, you know, plans and studies can only go so far. So what we really do uh, commit to is to share that with the, the people who are funding these studies and to really advocate for more implementation funding. You know, you can study a problem all day long, but if there's no dollars to implement the solutions, 
then the study, in my opinion, does not really go very far. Um, and there have been times where we've been asked to participate in things from folks who have relatively deep pockets, um, but they don't think about compensation of the folks that they are sourcing the material from, and we will not participate when that is the case. Um, so, you know, we really see the value in uh, compensating folks for their labor and their time, um, and we work to make sure that, that is included in conversations with policymakers as well. Hey, 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 Dion, the only thing I just want to add to that, and I echo, you know, everything I just heard from Alicia and Brianne, um, is that when you talk about legislation, it starts with legislators. Yes. <laughs> and I guess here in Milwaukee, you know, we have the the highest number of uh, black and brown elected officials, um, at least in our city government, than we've ever had. So in a city government perspective, uh, it's, it's going to be legislated. Um, you know, uh, equity can be legislated a little easier than per se at our state level. And I think a lot of people have seen what is happening in, in Wisconsin in terms of what, what our state uh, politics are. Uh, and, and the county level, I would also say we, we have that high number of uh, black and brown elected officials there as well. So we've been able to make progress because of those individuals who came from the community who are a bit more sensitive to, um, to, to the needs of those of, uh, individuals of, of black and brown background. You know, I guess I would also say that it seems like sometime all of us, I know across the country, we feel that we're at the beck and call of our policymakers all the time is the government, things they do. I guess my, my question to you would be, how do we, I know voting and everything is a wonderful thing and that's how we move the power just out of their hands and back into the people. But do you believe that there are more we can do individually as groups across this country to develop some financial wherewithal so if the policies are, are, are like they're saying in some of these cities are, are just telling you, you just can't do this, but that we can still do the things we need to do because we, we, we have the financial wherewithal, some kind of trust fund or something that we all can work together on to still push our programs and goals ahead. What do you think? So the, this is something that we have been talking a lot about in terms of paying lip service to racial equity but not actually paying. Mm -hmm. And it costs money to, to translate things, to get access to the businesses. It takes a lot of time. It takes full-time employees. It takes, it, it, so one of the things I think that we need to do as, as a, a sector is say no more. Uh, we are not going to do more for less. We are not going to spread the you know, limited dollars that we have across more and more and more businesses, that's not equitable. And so to say that with, you know, our, our Main Street grants, we, we are very grateful. We get about $150,000 annually for these Main Street grants. But we have some corridors that have 60 businesses and then other corridors that have 300 businesses. You cannot split $150,000 300 ways equitably. And to say that those, that the businesses, you know, that it's on them to access those resources, that's just not fair. And so part of it is understanding when we have to say no and, and find those partnerships. So really establishing, um, I think the understanding our ecosystems. So who, what other stakeholders are in your ecosystem and where are we duplicating efforts? Where are there areas where we could amplify each other's work where I'm not putting money towards that. I'm not putting staff time towards that because I know this other organization is doing that. And so I think from the nonprofit sector, we really need to get smarter about talking to our policymakers, talking to our other um, nonprofit leaders and and really trying to build the strength of our ecosystem so that we're doing we're working smarter not harder and we're spending our money more efficiently and effectively and then finding those partners in philanthropy in corporate america wherever that may be who will who have the same values that we do who will help invest in that work that's part of the reason why district bridges we started doing uh, consulting to build capacity and strengthen our small business ecosystem because we saw 
that need for so many small, uh, so many small nonprofits, you know, most main streets have one staff member, they don't have the time and capacity to build all of those other supports. So we, we need to work smarter um, and learn when to say no, because if you say no and no one else is stepping up to the plate, then they recognize that there has to be another solution and they have to throw more money at it. They have to, to adjust to that, to that no. So, yeah. yeah. Any other comment on that point? Yeah, and just to, to add to that, um, inspired by one of our sister communities in Livermore, we've actually started changing the way that we talk about our work um, and the funding stream. Um, you know, rather than uh, asking for grants from the city, we're, we're retooling it to be fee for service and really positioning ourselves as what we truly are, which is, you know, we, we feel and we believe that we are almost like an extension of the city's economic development department, right? So I have a monthly meeting with the, the person who has that department. We talk about um, what the business needs are. We talk about what the organizational needs are, you know, where we've been successful, where our pain points are, um, and how, you know, we can work better with the, their department, what they have going on. Um, and so, you know, we, we did uh, submit um, a funding request proposal on use of ARPA funds to basically, you know, provide sustained funding for our organization over the five years that it could be used. We clearly outlined, here's the value that we brought to the community, especially during COVID. Here's the number of businesses that we supported. Here's what they said that they needed. Here's what our expertise is. Here's where our partners are. You know, and we, we did all of this pretty much, you know, public government's shoestring. Um, and here's how we could be even more impactful in these specific areas, um, utilizing actually the Main Street approach transformation, you know, strategy. Um, as our framework, um, and also adding on a couple of things that we've been hearing from, you know, the mayor's office and economic development office on ways to activate the transit station. It's like, okay, well, we've been hearing from you guys for the past two or three years that you want to see this type of vendor kiosk program. We could do that for you. Here's how much it would cost. And so very similar to what Brianne just said, uh, you know, laying out what our strengths are, what our value is, and putting dollars to that and also changing how we speak about those dollars around a fee for service rather than grants, because that sets up a more, you know, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, like professional relationship where we're not just a nonprofit asking for handouts or for money, but we're actually asking for sustained funding so that we can then deliver to the, the cities who one of their larger goals around economic development um, in the city of Richmond. You know, I, I think that that's a good point, but I think also as not-for-profits, we have a tendency not to realize that we need to be creating some of our own economic development engines to fund ourselves. You know, and I think that that's a discussion and research that needs to be done that we need to look at and, and that, that there's some kind of ED engine that we, could, that we could come together, work across this country and fund ourselves so that we can have more freedom with the work that we do, you know? And I think we have to think about that more, you know? And, uh, and, and there's models, like, like Dion said, that there are some models of that. And I think we need to look at that more. We need to talk about that more. But right now, I wanna just thank you guys so much for being with us today. And I want, and maybe this is, a, this is one of our workshop topics that we need to talk about uh, over, over this year is economic development engines. And I'm sure DeShay probably got a lot of suggestions <laughs> that he want to throw on the table because he's doing it every day over there, you know, and I'm sure many people that are with us today might have some suggestions, but I would like to thank you guys so much for being with us today. This was a wonderful, wonderful lunch workshop, very informative. You know, and I hope that uh, we're going to send out information. Uh, uh, Dion has the uh, recording and everything, her and Gustavo, so that uh, we can send that information to you and that we can keep this conversation going, you know, as we uh, move on over the next several months. Uh, Dion, I know you had, you want to say something too before we close out here today. Sure, I just wanted to thank the presenters, one, for sharing your brilliance with us. All three of these presenters are brilliant in what they do. And I believe they all deserve a hand of applause or a Zoom <laughs> applause, you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You guys were fantastic. And I think that they all offer something. Again, you all are a part of this network, the Urban Main Network. Connect to them. Know that you have access to a national team of individuals that you can pick up the phone and call, right? And Sandra, what I was going to ask, thank you for having this conversation and, and thinking about, you know, starting this Lunch and Learn series. When can we expect the next Lunch and Learn series? Well, I would, I would hope that we can pull something together for August, you know, and so uh, we'll, I, I got to uh, drive Gustavo to death. <laughs> but we'll pull something together for August. I would like anybody that has some suggestions for a workshop topic to put it into uh, the chat box or send it to Dion, myself, or Gustavo. I do think that discussing the uh, economic development engine for a not-for-profit is a good discussion that we probably need to uh, not let go, but we'll try to move towards having another luncheon in August. Awesome. And I hope by then we'll either be able to meet in person or do some hybrid version of this, right? Yeah, well, you know what, quite frankly, I'm, I'm starting to like Zoom <laughs> because I can attend so many meetings and don't have to drive anywhere. I love it, you know, so it spoiled me, I think. <laughs> I'm tired of Zoom. I'm ready to see people. Um, so at any rate, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Yeah. Um, such a fantastic um, Lunch and Learn series, and we look forward to um, sharing more information about what is forthcoming in August. Maybe it'll be on economic engines, right? Absolutely. Thank you, guys, for all those that have attended, and we didn't, didn't get a chance for you to introduce yourself, but I do know some of the faces. I hope you'll be with us again in August, and like I said, you can contact Dion, myself, or Gustavo anytime you want to. We're there to help you or connect you with who, whatever you need or uh, know someone that can give you technical assistance on some of the projects that you're working on across this country. So we are there for you. You are not out here alone. Thank you. Thank you all. Have